Welcome to the one within all to another episode of Interverse. It's me, your host, Chance, and we're here to talk about some deep topics involving what might be our higher self, what might be the video game player behind the virtual reality that is our external 3D consensus world. And it's all revolving around this concept of the Daimon. And our guest today, Kat Nelligan, is calling in from over in the UK. She's currently working on, it's basically complete, a book called Discovering Your Personal Daimon. She's got a Kickstarter campaign that we can check out in the show notes as well. And we're going to go through the questions of what is this idea of a daimon from Kat's personal experience and some of the ancient uh, mythologies related to this subject, how these energies and entities affect us, especially in our youth, how to recognize these things uh, and the fast, many facets of this daimon. And probably in the second hour, we'll be talking about connecting with these uh, spirits that want to be helpful. So here we go. Let's get into it with Kat. How are you doing today? I'm, I'm not too bad. Yeah, not too bad over here. So let's start out with a little bit of, you know, Q&A about yourself. Let's see. First of all, like, <laughs> what's life like for somebody that is getting into this connection to the diamond? And how has your life changed from doing that? And then let's we'll transition from there to talking about what it is. But what's it been like for you to go on this journey of discovery? Yeah, I am. Um, it's it's been a it's been a wild ride uh, to begin with. Um, I've I came across the diamond because I got into astrology, and so even that has been quite a, a recent thing for me. This is about two three years ago, and um, I found astrology because I was really into different like personality type tests. Um, do you know about the Enneagram? Yeah, yeah, I do. That's the not the type of nine based numerology that is a way of looking at personality profiles. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And I found a book, um, which was about the Enneagram and astrology and I picked it up not realizing astrology was part of it. And I was like, Oh my gosh, this, I can get behind the Enneagram, but astrology that's way out there. Um, after speaking to a friend about it, she kind of convinced me that actually not only is astrology, well, in her, in, from her perspective, not only is astrology like not scientific, neither is the Enneagram, neither is Myers-Briggs and all of these things that I was, you know, putting a lot of weight on. But rather than me saying, okay, well, I guess I won't use any of those tools anymore. Um, it kind of gave me permission to look at non-scientific um, tools and practices that could tell me a bit about myself. And so that's kind of how I got into astrology. And through that, through basically a podcast episode, which spoke about identifying a particular planet in our birth charts, um, that could speak to a personal daimon. And when I heard daimon, I, I thought of, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but like the full Philip Pullman series uh, of books. So his dark materials where like every character has, um, yeah, a personal daimon, a little like in that book series, they're like little animals or um, like birds and all kinds of things that you have as a kind of accompanying guide, a familiar almost. So that instantly kind of got my childhood imaginary friend kind of like wishes um, excited. And and I looked more into this idea of the daimon um, and, and the history of it. Uh, and also, of course, how, how that could tie into my interest in astrology. So, so that's kind of the how, um, how has that been? Well, I mean, this all happened to me in 2019 when I was, um, traveling, I kind of had left my um, apartment back in the UK. I was looking for all of the new things. I just wanted to like start a new life and I didn't really know what that looked like. And so this idea that you could have a guiding spirit or entity, uh, that could basically tell you, tell you the way, like tell you, all right, that's not a good fit for you. That is a good fit for you. Um, that was very appealing naturally because I was feeling quite lost at that time. Um, and I, I guess I could say that I've, I have like found those things that I was looking for, at least for now. I mean, who knows how those things will change and even in the near, near future, but, uh, that, that feels like it's been part of my personal journey in doing this research into the diamond, but also trying to live with the diamond in my life. Yeah. One of the biggest mysteries of self-discovery is what do I really want? <laughs> There's 
infinite yeah. choices in the life that we can move into and actually getting to the root of how to make those decisions can be maybe one of the more challenging aspects of living a life. And there's a bunch that has to be cleared out of the way, but it's also about opening communication channels. And I think that on the fractal sense, a good way to do that, to open up the communication channels to spiritual guides and benevolent energies that might be following you around and invested in your success is uh, to communicate yourself. Actually, the more that you express yourself, and just let that expression flow out, whatever it is, and get what's inside out, I think the more open you become to messages that are meant for you. And that's like a cool paradox of how the inner reflects the outer. So that's kind of my take on my, as I've gotten better at knowing what I truly want, it seems to line up with me expressing myself more. Yeah, it almost sounds like, um, I mean, that's very similar to my approach. I kind of take an experimental like trial and error approach. Um, my diamond isn't like literally whispering me the answers to the test questions. It's really more me kind of having a hunch, trying something out and then getting feedback from that, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's like a feedback loop that we got to connect our part of it. It's more like a feedback web actually, because even with the idea of the diamond, I'm sure that there's more on your team than just that one entity, but maybe that's like team leader. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that's the other fun thing to look at because as soon as you get into this question about the diamond and, and even just that word and the different kind of permutations of that, um, people have different takes on this. You know, some people would say that you can have a, a personal diamond, but then there might be, um, like, I believe there was like an astrological diamond, which was separate. This is to the I think the Neoplatonists had that you could just go down all these different routes. And, um, and that also brings up this point that the daimon wasn't always personal. So when people talk about daimons, like, yes, in the same way, there are like demons and it's basically a spirit. Um, so with my work, I was very specifically trying to talk about a personal daimon. Um, but yeah, you could have all kinds of forces and actually trying to differentiate between them is a, is a whole job in itself, I guess. Yeah, and I think for anybody that might have their own sort of take on these things from personal research, it's good to put things on the shelf and just go into a conversation like this with an open mind and recognize that this is a word we're using that is encompassing an idea that we're going to try to flesh out as we go, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're talking about the same thing that everyone that's ever written about it was talking about because on the etymological level, you have some very interesting uh, connections to this word on the sounds like level, for example, in Greek demos, which is spelled slightly differently, but sounds quite similar to daimon. Demos actually means dread. So there's another aspect of this that comes in that they're, you know, people were afraid of these type of spirits or that these were in a sense, like gods that you were fearing, God fearing <laughs> that type of idea because of the influence they have over the 3d reality that is kind of beyond our ability to comprehend. But I personally look at it like any energies that have influence over the 3d waking world consensus reality are totally going to be a reflection of the energy that you hold and cultivate within yourself. So to me, that's like the ultimate control point or really the only control point that we have in the 3D world is maintaining our personal energy at the level of coherence and charge that we want it to be at and then letting the rest of the world fall into place around that. Yeah, completely. And it's making me think a lot about um, possession because you know, what one of the parts of the book I did want to address is this kind of conflation with with daimon and demon and that, that there are ways of differentiating this. But that idea of a daimon possessing you, um, whether that's for good or for evil and, and who knows w which it is um, at times, um, that, that goes way back. Uh, I just watched, this is like, probably loads of people have already seen it, but The Conjuring, I just watched that this morning um, when it wasn't dark and I could actually watch a scary film. And that that's all about, you know, spirits that possess um, and this kind of battle between your own will and the light versus the dark kind of, kind of thing. So, 
So I'm just wondering now. <laughs> right. And really demon in a, another way of looking at it from the etymological level has to do with similar to the idea of like deus or deus two. You are talking about with demonic possession. I like to look at things as a yes and. So you could be considering this on an energetic level that you've got compartmentalized and fragmented parts of your aura that are not in communication with each other in this web inside in a broken feedback loop between parts of your personal energy. And then that's the divided man, daimon or demon, you know, mm -hmm. and that is where the uh, toxicity creeps in because without that flow established the way it needs to be in a natural sense, you get stagnation. And I think energy is consciousness. So if you have energy that's stuck in a stagnating container, then it's going to express in a mental plane or the spiritual plane as an individuated, but kind of evil <laughs> form of consciousness. So when we're talking about this idea of connecting with the personal diamond, that's restoring communication, that's restoring flow. And even in the simplest sense, how to deal with a fragmented part of your own personal energy is to be able to see it again, be able to feel it again. And that naturally brings it back to circulation and will begin the process of healing. Like, it, you know, energy flows where attention is directed. So it, there's a, it's not something that we should be scared of, but we should be aware that there's this possibility for the dynamic of forces feeling like they're controlling us if we are not being radically honest with ourselves about everything that we can be. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's a huge part that I was trying to get across in um, this book, which was your diamond dem well, is demanding your attention, your consciousness, and that when we don't give it that, and when we are a bit more like um, passive or I can't remember how you put it, but yeah, when we're sort of trying to deny some of these parts of ourselves um, or the, the diamond, however you want to see that, um, that's when the diamond can kind of turn demonic. That's when, um, you know, and, and you'll see this in the lives of like great artists and writers who were basically, um, they, they were certainly creating great work, but they were, they were overcome by the diamond uh, in many different ways. And, and for other people, um, you know, that, that there's an argument to be made for like certain like chronic illnesses where, uh, I, like I've got a friend who was basically just in a, in a job that she really hated, uh, for a long time. And, and that really wore her down. And it was through bringing her attention to, you know, what I would see as what her diamond wanted, which is what, you know, helped her get better. So it's, it is all about like where our kind of conscious, um, attention goes. Big time. So let's uh, continue on to some of the awesome notes you provided with me, which is super helpful. I appreciate that. And maybe talk more about, you know, we're still in this sort of what is the diamond and you did give me some good places to jump from there. Let's go ahead and talk about maybe your first encounter. I think that for you, it, it seems like it's more of a guardian angel thing that you were initially tapping into. Very initial. I mean, one of the things that I thought back to was, you know, I was raised Catholic and my mom, um, when I was scared at, you know, at night, she would tell me that I've got a guardian angel watching over me. And, uh, I found that deeply comforting. And I think when I was looking into the diamond, especially in at that time in my life, like in 2019, I was like really looking for that kind of comfort. Um, but guardian turned for me more into guiding because what I've come to see is that the way I'm understanding the diamond is that it's not just a being who is protecting us. Oh, that would be nice. But the, the, the personal diamond that I'm talking about um, is most interested in holding you to what I would call your destiny or, you know, the path that you, um, you know, if, if you're talking about a kind of old like idea from, um, Plato's Republic, then that would be to do with the life you chose and holding you to that life. Um, yeah, different people are going to have different takes on this. But for me, I found that very helpful. The idea that we have a guiding spirit whose kind of job it is to remind us of the life we picked. Um, yes, yeah, that, that's kind of one of my like kind of core beliefs around the diamond, I'd say. 
Yeah. Could you expand more on that for maybe through your personal experience or how that can look? Because I totally agree. I think that that's a very empowering perspective as well to even look at challenging experiences that maybe a person in a more fearful mentality would be like, Oh, this, these like spirits are causing bad things to happen to me and ruining my life. But in my opinion, everything that happens is for your enlightenment and your enjoyment and everything that happens is in an alignment with your highest original intention for incarnating. But the fun of life is that that's a mystery. It's my story as opposed to playing out the patterns of his story, which has been given to us by the society and the configuration of personality that you're told you need to express in order to be successful in this matrix world in getting into the mystery. That's your story. And you uncover it one stone at a time and one baby step on the path as you go. And that's kind of my take on it. And it's cool to uncover that. And also super safe to go ahead and let go and accept that even the hardest stuff that was your life experiences were something that you chose to come in and do so that you could grow in the way that you wanted to grow. Exactly. And I like that you brought up those kind of the, the more subjectively difficult experiences because they're all part of the path too. They're all part of the, the, the original choice. Um, I need to tell a story. So like the myth of Ur, which is um, kind of ends Plato's Republic, uh, tells a story about um, a soldier who died on the battlefield, um, spent, I believe, seven days dead, effectively, before coming back to life and telling this tale. Um, and in the tale, what he sees is the kind of um, the in and out process of, of souls um, who are about to like go into incarnation on, on this on earth uh, and also return to you know, whatever the kind of version of heaven was. Um, but basically he's seeing the souls picking their lives and also picking a diamond to, um, or even being assigned a diamond, people have different takes on that, uh, that will kind of hold them to that life. Um, I found that, I, I don't know why, but that, that to me felt very reassuring because it made, obviously it's, it's a myth, but it's a helpful lens, I think, to see um, that, again, like you said, the, these kind of things that happen to us are all part of it. And it will make sense, hopefully, I think, either when we look back at our life at the end of life, or um, if we get that chance, or um, yeah, you know, who, who knows what happens after uh, the physical body dies. So the, this this kind of comes back to this idea of destiny. And maybe I'll, um, we'll get into that in a bit. But the other story is Socrates, who was one of the most like kind of famous, notable figures who had a daimon. And that daimon would tell him what to stay away from, what not to do. Uh, and the, the kind of key part of that story for me was Socrates went like willingly to his death. Um, and there is kind of a, a, a bit of writing, like there's a quote from Socrates that said, that alleged that he said his daimon didn't um, it didn't object to him going to his death. Therefore, he kind of knew that that was, you know, that that's his lot. That, that's what he's meant to do. Um, so again, that was kind of going back to the guardian thing. I don't think the guard, the daimon is just trying to keep us safe and keep us alive. It really wants to hold us to our destiny. Um, and you asked about like a personal story. And I mean, I feel a bit, um, I can't say with confidence that I'm doing exactly what the diamond wants of me. It feels like I am. It feels like I'm meant to, for example, practice astrology and, and take that into the world uh, because I feel like I'm getting yeses from the diamond. I, ca I, can't, I can't be sure. I'm still at the very beginning of this journey. But what I will say is that feels very different to how I felt a decade ago when I was working in a, a web design agency and like hating my life and kind of acting it out in different ways. So if, if that's any kind of yes and no, I feel like I'm on a yes right now, but at the same time, I could easily, I could, I could be wrong. This is, this is, I think, part of the work with, with the diamond. I would like to feel like Socrates apparently did, which is I'm getting firm yeses or firm no's from my diamond. Um, but I'm still working on that personally. I think it's always going to be a little bit of room for wiggle 
<laughs> right. <laughs> Nature isn't super precise the way that we would want it to be in our left brain analytical type of society. But uh, I think listening to the body is a good channel for connecting to the guidance. I think that that if you look at the guides as just part of your total energy system that com- encompasses who you are even beyond the bot- the 3D reality, I think the body is like a fractal uh as below version of that and that body is sort of representing the shadow or the unconscious because you're only really able to pay attention to like one part of your body at once like well how does it feel inside my fingertip and you can zoom into that or then you can zoom into your your feet or get into your chest and there's a way that i think the body can give us this message of a, a total yes or a total no about things if we're willing to pay attention to it I've been trying to live my life by the philosophy. If it ain't a hell yes, it's a hell no. <laughs> and that makes, makes all the difference because then you don't find yourself compromising on the big things. And that doesn't mean you'll always be right, but it, you'll, you'll self-correct really well if that's sort of your mentality. Totally. I mean, and I, I love that mantra as well. And one thing though that I've, I've personally found is unhooking from a lot of the external shits. It's like, well, if, if, if I'm feeling the the no, how is saying that no going to affect other people? Um, so this idea of, you know, we are connected in, in, in different ways. And I don't know, that's been a philosophy that I I really, I, I stand for, but I also struggle with. Um, yeah. It is a paradox of all one, but also individuals. Right. I say it all the time. So I'll just say it again. All one is the same as alone with just one missing L. So when you think about that spirit and the life force energy and universe as a whole is really just one thing comprised of a bunch of individuals, then that feeling of everything being all one is only really in effect when you are embracing your aloneness or your individuality. The fact that you are in a sense, like the only thing that you can be sure about is you. <laughs> and so it's not that you're solipsistic. It's not that you reject truth as is presented to you from the external, but like that inner knowing is where you need to operate from. But I had a question while we're still talking about the, what is a diamond? Uh, do you have anything in th- that you could say about distinguishing what is an actual guiding energy versus something like what you call roaming earthbound spirits or because I've done plenty of research into this and there's all sorts of types of possession or hitchhikers right along so that you can get in your field. And I like to just be open to a multiplicity of explanations for the same thing because some people need to hear it one way and other people it helps to hear it another way. But I definitely at this point accept that not everybody that leaves their body uh, spiritually leaves this realm the way that they maybe ought to. And that can cause some, some serious problems for people that they jump into because of a vulnerability that mirrors what that spirit was weak to when they were in a body themselves. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And this is, this is something that I'd like to do a hell of a lot more research into. And, um, at the moment from the p- people I've spoken to about this, part of it is, you know, it's, it's multi faceted, but like one part is, is practice, like practice, um, intentionally addressing, speaking to your diamond and, and seeing what, what comes up. I think that there is a consistent voice or a tone or a even personality that I believe I'm getting from the diamond. Um, it's not like something kind of totally different comes every time. And I'm like, who the hell are you? It's like, Oh no, that's, that's the diamond. Um, I also think like part of the foundation for this and, you know, again, this isn't something that I had that that I could address in the book, but knowing a decent, like being fairly self-possessed to begin with is helpful. Um, like I I would say that, and I, I don't know what you think, but would you say that some people are maybe more prone to, um, you know, in both ways, some people have like an easier, let's say channel to the diamond, but they'll also have be more open to other spirits, let's say latching on. 
whereas some people might be closed, but they might be closed to, to, to all of it. I, um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, sorry, did you have more to articulate? No, before no, no, I get that, into that was, it? no, but does that make sense? Yeah, I like, I like when the guest asks me questions. <laughs> yeah, trust me, I'm still researching this stuff. So I'd like to hear your take. Yeah, I think that it's kind of a paradox that when you're close to spirit, you're actually more vulnerable to being manipulated by, by uh, spirits. And I, I look at it like all of it is archetype. And if there's an archetype or part of yourself, a part of your personality spectrum that's in disorder within, or, you know, it's something that you don't accept about yourself or you're expressing in an unhealthy way, then that aspect or that archetype will come at you in the external world or even express itself through you in an unhealthy or an unbalanced way. But it's all there, just like the positive connection to the daimon, it's all there actually in the end to serve your imperial self in the sense that it's a wake up call. Like if it has to come and slap you in some metaphorical sense to get you to recognize where you're out of whack, then eventually that's what's going to happen. And I look at it like you get little quakes and then big earth shakes and it just gets more and more extreme. And once you see it that way and you look at everything as flow state or lack of flow state, then you can actually catch on at the very early stages of the uh, dissonance. Like for me, it's like <laughs> really simple. But if I find myself getting, if I look at my arms and my legs and I'm covered with like scratches and bruises and I've uh, been stubbing my toes a lot and, you know, stepping on things that are sharp or all kinds of stuff where it's just a reflection of a lack of awareness of my body and my spatial coordinates. That to me is like the very first early warning system that, hey, something about what you're trying to force in life right now is out of sync and out of flow. And if you catch it that early, you won't get to the point where it's like, well, now we got to get you into a car wreck or now we're going to burn your house down. <laughs> like we're coming after you. <laughs> this isn't working and we're going to end it one way or the other. And you can, you can preempt the hard parts of that process. Not that life, not that you can make yourself totally immune to big challenges in life. Sometimes they're important and necessary, but I think that actually nature works in smooth transitions all the time up until the point where there's no other choice, but the cataclysm. So I don't know. I can't make you any promises, people out there, but I do think that if you pay attention to life in the way that I'm suggesting, it might save you a lot of the the lows and the the real fearful moments, at least most of the time. I, I love that. I, I said a bunch of things I tried to make notes on, but um, one of that one of the things that I kind of keep seeing as a pattern about what you're saying is this idea of paying attention intentionality and that is very much related to the daimon when you look into um the sort of symbolism of the daimon in astrology and that's maybe a part of a later conversation but this idea of the daimon being how or the, the choices that we make in response to the kind of fate that we're, we're dealt with in life um so I, I just find that interesting. It's like, a th this is all the same stuff. You don't have to think of the diamond as um, literally a spirit. It, it could even be your own sense of direction in life. Um, one of the questions that is kind of related to this idea of, is it the diamond? Is it just some random hitchhiker? People ask me, how do I know it's not just my intuition? Or they'll, they'll use another word, or they might talk about the shadow or the anima or the animus. And I'm like, like only you can know that. And again, it kind of comes back to our experimental approach. I want to say too, it, why not just look at it as yes. And yeah, if it's easier yeah. or it makes more sense to them to look at it in that way, just be like, I think we're talking about the same thing. And this is just yeah. my way of explaining it. That way exactly. there's not like this divide between, well, who's right and who's wrong about this. And instead we're just trying to get to the root of how to know what we really want and what's good for us. Yeah. Um, categorizing it is less important than, than the effect, I guess. Um, and when you were talking about the, the sort of like getting like bumps and, um, yeah, stubbing your toe and stuff, it just kind of made me think about, um, one of my th theories I had, had earlier this year, which was, um, I, I took up skateboarding for the first time in my life, um, age 33. And I decided that it was something that my diamond really, really liked. And like my diamond just loved me skateboarding. And that was something I did with my diamond that was just like a theory that I was having. Um, I, I don't know if that's true. Maybe it, maybe it is, but, uh, 
every time I took my pads off uh, and then like whoever I was skateboarding with, they might be, oh, let's just go down there. That's when I would, well, initially I would say, no, I, I won't because I'm, I'm not wearing, I need to put my pads on and everything. And then a voice in my head would say, just go and do it anyway. And I would inevitably always get hurt when I did that. And for a while, I, I was like, hang on, d- did my diamond want me to do that and get hurt? Or was it the initial voice telling me not to do it and not get hurt and put my pads on? So, so that was a kind of like a thing where ultimately, I don't think it matters which one was the diamond. I think I just need to look, listen to the, the first voice that says, stay safe. Intuition is like, usually like the first answer that jumps in your head is the better one. Yeah, when you're taking yeah. a multiple choice test, that's usually a good call. Like first answer is your strong one. Yes. Yes. Assuming like you're not drunk or something or like under the influence <laughs> or something. Yeah. 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 And yeah. you know, you said we, you were, we started to talk about intention and I just want to look at that word from a green language level where it's in tension. It's not just intention, but your intention what are you in tension with? It's you holding this connection between your deeper self or your total self and what your conscious awareness is able to focus on because it's only able to take a slice of that totality, that infinity, but you're holding the line and you're pulling it towards yourself. You're pulling your greater will towards yourself through Mm -hmm. intention and you're creating tension on that line. You're you know, does that make sense? Like, and that is just like a rubber band. Whenever you tense it and pull it back, then you're able to let it go. And when you let things go from that point, then you get launched and things can be pretty wild. I love that. And I love it because it has that sense of um, movement or becoming or in the process of which intention has, because intention isn't like, well, intended. It's like, yeah, I did, I did that. But intention is like, you're about to, like you said, that, that kind of like pulling back. So yeah. And it's a rhythm cool. too. It's not just that you hold the tension, but then there's the letting go because mm-hmm. if you have an intention, but you can't accept it not coming true, you can't let it go. Then you're stuck in the lack or the want mentality. So it's this cool dance of the rhythm between pulling yourself through intention and then letting go of needing it to be a certain way and watching how that sends you flying in the direction that you were oriented. Yeah. Yeah. Like an arrow. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Well, let's talk more about your story with the diamond. That's a section in your notes. And it seems like you were wanting to start with talking about how these uh, energies and entities interact with us as children before some of the, the walls go up. Can we, uh, can we go there? Yeah. And, and this kind of uh, was something I came across because of uh, an astrologer who spoke about a technique to do with the diamond and his kind of tip was to look back at our lives uh when we were kids and i kind of got into that like yeah before i don't know society told us actually be this way or um you know i i for example really wanted to be i, I really like drawing as a kid like most kids do before you get told oh actually that doesn't look like a cat that looks like a horse you know forget about it but I really did want to be an artist. And I do remember being told like, yeah, I mean, you could, it's tough though. And don't expect to make a lot of money from it. It's not like, um, and even in, in my schooling system, art was like a kind of different route. You kind of had to apply to, to schools and uh, like college or university in a different way. And the whole path was very like blocked in, in different ways. Um, so it's returning to these things. And while I'm, you know, I'm definitely not an artist now, I'd like to paint still like, cause that, that feels, um, so it's not a, tr- it's not like an occupation, but you do it vocationally in the sense that it's just for enjoyment. It's yeah. Yeah. It keeps my diamond happy. Let's say, you know, that would be a way to, to describe it. And when I don't do that, when I, it's been a long time, I do get, um, kind of like frustrated in different ways. It's like, I, I know something's off if I haven't, you know, painted something or, or drawn something for a while. And it, and it could even, it's been at different times in my life, um, months or years. And that kind of lack or that, like that, that emptiness, um, gets felt. It's a communications breakdown to go back to what I was saying about, if you want to receive communication, 
and guidance you need to express yourself too. It's a reflection of these things. Completely. Um, and also, I mean, and I really liked what you said about the kind of alone or one piece, but one of the key, like the core feelings I had in 2019 was this feeling of aloneness. Um, I was like traveling, which I thought was, you know, this is my favorite thing to do. This is amazing. I love that I get to do this. Yeah, but it, it really sucked like for the majority of it. So a lot of my personal story with the diamond was about seeking the other and to, in many ways and, and throughout, this is also like a kind of cultural thing with, with diamonds is that the diamond can kind of present itself as a, um, whether it's like the witch is familiar, like a little black cat or a newt or something, um, or you see that, it, yeah, just in, in different tribes where, um, people have these kind of spirit guides or, um, counterparts soulmates really um sorry and now i'm kind of like going off on another train what was the original question well it's okay you can take this train to its destination and then we can yeah. bring it back around to the question about childhood experiences with yeah. the diamond and how you know kids may have a different sensitivity to that which could be pretty useful information for parents out there or people that will be parents because you might look differently at the imaginary friends your kid talks about. Totally. And, and my world was really populated by imaginary friends. And I, I carried beanie babies who I spoke to until I was maybe about 10, maybe, and maybe that's an underestimation. So, so there was, um, and, and I think maybe that, that helped me feel less alone. So that, that kind of does come into it, that the comfort a kid might get from the imaginary friend. Um, that's valid. That's, that's valid. I think there's something there. Um, yeah, I think, I think my main thing with, with the childhood piece is there were probably things that we were all showing interested in, um, when we were young before, again, like society in different ways told us to put that down and to kind of like get in line. So that's kind of one of my main points with that. Um, yeah. And, and whether or not kids are sort of more attuned to sensing the diamond and maybe it's not like it doesn't necessarily have to come as like a vision that, that they might have of like a spirit telling them what to do but just a knowing just just really just i want to do this i'm being you know led to do this this feels no good filters to me. yeah yeah exactly um i think that's a really inspiring thing to look at and, and to try to recall you know, what was that like when you know, I, we made like dens, like dens are still the best thing. Like I still have an urge to make a den in my living room. Um, oh much. yeah. I love making blanket forts, yes, bringing course. all the chairs out of the dining room table and setting up tunnels and pathways. I would do that and make little hidey places where I would just go in and read an entire book, like yeah. finish a whole Harry Potter novel in yes. practically a day. Good times. Exactly. Exactly. So why, why stop? <laughs> Um, yeah. So does, uh, what else did I want to say on, on that? Um, yeah. I, and I am interested in this idea of that sense of feeling alone, I think can also be a, a call to the diamond or the diamond's call to us. Um, because I, I do think I felt less, um, you know, walking anyone's path. You're the only one who can walk it. You, you're only, you can walk, you know, your path, whatever it is you choose to do. Um, but I think having some kind of like awareness of a, a diamond who is encouraging you on that and who's also walking that path, like it's, it's according to the myth of Ur, it's, it's the diamond's job to walk with us. So um, I find that very comforting. And, and that's part of my book is does seek to comfort. It's, it's not, it might be uncomfortable at times, but um, ultimately it's, it's not about feeling, um, scared basically yeah and i like to look at it as not even so much a separate entity maybe another way of considering it is that if life is a video game there's a player that's holding the playstation controller on the other side of the veil and that's you and this is your avatar that you're running around with right so that's great. in that sense it's like the you need to keep moving in interesting directions. Otherwise the player is just going to set down the controller and walk away. 
at least metaphorically, but do you think that in the periods of life where we just keep rejecting our hero's call that this uh, being might even give up on trying to talk to us? Definitely not. I mean, I, that's just, I don't think it could. I think it, it can actually, I mean, again, I don't know if this, this is true for everyone, but it was said by, I think it was a Iamblichus, a, a Neoplatonist in the second or third century who said, um, the daimon can choose to like hand over your, your life, your, you know, its responsibility to another daimon. So I, I quite like that idea of like a daimon just being like, I can't, I can't, you know, deal with this, this, this soul. Like they're not listening to me. I personally don't think that the daimon can ever abandon us. I think the daimon wants to connect with us just as much as we want to connect with it. Um, but yeah, it, it can, you know, d- can we live a life that is, was completely not what we planned? I mean, that's, that's another question is because like, we never get stall, told, but eventually you'll get to it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you got to like do the, do it again. Well, this is the other thing. And I, I don't like to think about life as a test of, all right, you a hundred percent followed the script. Like, I, I don't think that's how it works. I do think there's something to be said for how subjectively satisfying, not even easy, but just like satisfying or rewarding as that being a kind of guidance system. Um, Back to the video like, game metaphor. It's like, yeah. there's a level that you're in, but it's an open world type of level. And you can, there's a lot of improv in terms of how you get from one side to the other. And that's, you know, again, back to yes. And instead of a binary mentality on things, it's not that it's predestination only, or that is free will only, but that it's kind of both. But then at the higher level, it's all free will because spirit made the whole game and spirit is freedom. Yeah. 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 I like that. And I definitely subscribe to the idea that there are lots of paths leading to the same place. Um, and that's, you know, one path isn't necessarily better than another if it's generally in the right direction, as long as you're not kind of like going backwards. Another thing that I wanted to tell you about was, uh, somebody I spoke to another astrologer who said their diamond told them that they were them looking back at themselves at the end of life. So it's like, this is astrologer going, going in this direction. And then the diamond at the end of their life is kind of them looking back. If, if that makes some kind of sense. Yeah. It's like, you're, it's that intention thing, holding the line between two sides of the timeline in a way mm-hmm. and meeting in the middle is where you'll find the inspiration to go the direction that feels best to you because that other part of yourself is working backwards in a sense, like reverse engineering the intention and you're going in the, what appears to be the forward direction, but time is really more of like a all at once thing. And it's just our conscious mind that goes through it on a linear. Exactly. And to me, that that's the diamond. Like we don't even necessarily need like a cute little spirit animal, though. I do like that idea. I, I think that that encompasses it really nicely for me anyway. Well, so let's talk more about you and 2019 and your quest to renew your life and encountering the diamond again. Um, You talked about in your notes how you actually begin to have sort of visual experiences maybe and even personifying things like anxiety as uh, (laughs) creatures that are part of your your sort of field and your your team. Yeah, and and I guess you know, and, and now I'm still like tentative of being like, okay, well, that little dragon I saw was my diamond. Maybe it was. Um, my experience at the time was I was experiencing this intense anxiety that I'd never had in my life. Um, astrologically, it could sort of be, be seen in my chart at the time, but I I was inspired to sort of try to grapple with that anxiety and see it as something. And, um, you know, I, I, I was sitting with it really trying to feel into, you know, those sensations and, um, without trying to like, kind of think about why I was having that anxiety because that I I couldn't figure out on the, on a mind level. Um, and what I saw was there was a little 
black and purple dragon in me. Uh, and it, and it was, you know, I kind of made friends with it cause it was kind of cute. Um, but it was also like a bit crazy and it was blowing fire. And over that, um, a few months, basically, I kept kind of coming back to this dragon whenever I felt the anxiety and, and over time it, it kind of dissipated and ultimately the anxiety went away early in 2020. I was sitting in a, a tea meditation, basically a tea meditation ceremony. And I went off into, um, a kind of, I guess just like a visualization where I was flying on a very big black and purple dragon. Um, and it led me to a house and, and, you know, the story continues, but to, to me, that felt like a continuation of, of this story. Um, Do you tell which more was, of that story <laughs> or is it uh, too it, personal? I mean, it's, it's not that it's personal, but it, it won't really mean anything. Like it's, I, I'm still trying to figure it out if I'm honest. Oh, it took me understand. to the house and um, there was a kind of a very much like a, I saw like a Mercury, a Hermes type person um, who was also kind of like a, a girl who I'd met earlier in the year at a retreat. And it, it, it was just, and it ended up me being in a big house with like all of my friends. It was like a really positive resolution, but that dragon is now still asleep in that field, like where it left me. So, I, so, I mean, that's you know, like, I'll just like reveal that part of my inner life, that that's something that's still there. It kind of, that story at least paused. Um, and that it paused basically around the time that I really started saying to myself, okay, I really want to, try to understand this this diamond stuff a lot more um but again it's it's going to come in in different ways for different people for me that was a helpful way of like for me personifying things is really helpful i like seeing things as as creatures you know whereas some other people in the book will, will probably pr prefer um uh the more kind of conceptual stuff around diamond as destiny for example well you um, Brought up, can I interject here? Yeah. You yeah. brought up that you saw this as a dragon or you have had experiences with a dragon. That's fascinating to me because uh, we talked before we started recording about the Pierre Sabak holographic culture book that I've been taking my time with because it is so dense and it's, it's an amazing etymological journey into these type of concepts, but on a very high level look. And one thing I learned from that book is that the word dragon actually comes from the Greek word dracon, D-R-A-K-O-N, which actually means seeing one, one who sees. And this is exactly the same concept as what you get in the Hebrew of the watchers or the seraphim. And the seraphim were these literally the original concept of angels. They oftentimes were uh, depicted as these just beings of eyes and wings and the uh, seraphim are also connected to the concept of the pilots of a vessel, steersmen of a vessel, which could be that the vessel is your body and they're the ones watching from inside of this vessel and steering it in some sense. And the seraphim, that word also connects to words that give you like a reptilian type of concept or a flaming serpent, a spiritually existing thing that, so there it is like, you're seeing a dragon, but the word dragon comes from this idea of a spiritual being that is a watcher, a dracon in Greek. So maybe without even knowing that, you're still tapping into this interesting atavistic, atavistic architecture of consciousness that the ancients have been trying to tell us about through language. And it's been encoded in our words for all this time. And most of us have never really put two and two together. I love that. And I'll, I'll add one more layer, which is, you know how like dragons were... Um, like I think there was one kind of dragon which didn't have wings or legs. So it's basically a snake and that the snake and the dragon have kind of been seen as, I guess, interchangeable. Oh, well, look at Chinese depictions of a dragon. It's basically right. like a flying serpent. Yes. Yeah. And the, um, the daimon, at least as a household God kind of figure. So not the personal daimon, but kind of like the personal daimon, more of a kind of a well-wisher to your house um, and family that was personified as a, a snake in ancient Alexandria. So my, like, I'm all about like, like I have like a snake ring that I wear in my diamond classes. And you, you know, it's that, that symbol is really tied into the diamond for me, but I hadn't kind of come at it from that other angle with 
the dragon and the seraphim and all of that. So yeah, that's fun. (laughs) (laughs) It's pretty wild that like to me, that's highly significant because it's been the most interesting place for me to research personally is the etymological gravy train going between ancient Hebrew and Greek and Latin and English that is very similar set of puns and word plays between languages that make you have to wonder like either the same people made these different languages after some tower of Babel moment, or maybe even these beings are part of influencing the architecture of our world through how they influence our behavior individually, because something is guiding all the synchronicity and intelligent, intelligent outcomes of this reality. There's, so much that happens in my life that's absolutely perfect and precisely what's needed with zero control on my end of making that happen. And the only thing that I have control over to lead me to those synchronicities is to just keep in the flow state. Mm -hmm. One example of that too, in terms of communicating with these watchers that might be living inside of our energy fields is that whenever I'm definitely flow mode, I actually will sometimes have a spontaneous bard code come out. (laughs) I'll start literally like speaking to myself in rhyme and telling myself things that are very deep, like higher self awareness things, but it always comes out almost like I'm doing hip hop or something and in a rhyme. And I think that that's part of the, the fun for knowing whether or not something communicating with you is really aligned with spirit is that it's always got this twist on it, that it's prosaic and poetic at the same time. It's not just one or the other. It's not telling you what to do. It's expressing uh, what is, and there's always like a fun to it and a playfulness to it whenever it's really the good juice. Yeah. And like, they're like statements of truth. And that's why I think when you hear um, like channeled, stuff or read channel stuff. And again, people resonate with different things, but I've found, I mean, I, I used to be really into Abraham Hicks and I would, I just like, it, it would send me into a flow state, just listening to this woman saying like pleasing statements. Um, I, yeah, I think that's fascinating. And, uh, I think you should record some of that. And it's um, always too spontaneous, but <laughs> I always wish like, man, someone should have heard that. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm a genius. <laughs> And even the word genius comes from a similar root of uh, the gin and the gene genie that are a similar idea of being of smokeless fire, a spiritual entity behind the scenes. And, you know, sometimes I wonder, I would love your take on this. If some of the ways that we've been told these type of entities and energies are negative or evil is actually just because people that want to be the masters in this world and rule despite what spirit wants need us to be afraid of these voices from beyond the veil that maybe are actually just trying to urge us back into a a sense of wholeness, or maybe there is, I mean, Sabak talks about a type of divide between the, the beings, if you will, where some want to rule here and others want to serve the larger structure of, you know, God's will or God's creation whatever your conceptualization of that is, nature, universe, whatever. But these are questions that I'm still personally grappling with, but the, I seem to do better the more that I trust and uh, flow with the idea that the only thing that actually is real is love and potential and fear is the illusion and restriction is the illusion. Yeah. Yeah. But you, it sounds like you don't deny that fear is a thing, right? It's people do me, feel just, it, but like, we don't have to live by it. No, definitely not. And, and for me, it kind of comes back to that age old, um, battle of good versus evil, light versus dark. And it, it doesn't need to be a stressful thing because I'm off the side that well, the good will always prevail. And like you said, that the other is the absence of that thing. Um, but I, I definitely think that that's a really interesting idea that you know, if everyone was really like tuned in, uh, with their, their, what I'm calling the diamond, um, would we, would we be acting like we do? Would we be buying as much as we do? Would we feel as like empty? And, you know, my thing coming back to the aloneness thing, which was, uh, like part of a big kind of, 
um, driving force in 2019 of kind of figuring this diamond stuff out. Uh, and how, how do we behave when we feel like that? Well, we're probably going to spend more time scrolling through Instagram and buying crap we don't need. Um, what if we weren't feeling like that and, and we did feel more like reassured um, and peaceful and, and, and guided by these, you know, I would say mostly benevolent forces um, if, or if anything um, kind of neutral. I could totally see there being other forces which would want to keep that knowledge separate from us, um, keep it away from us. Yeah, we'll have to explore this more in hour two. Uh, there's a lot going through my head on this subject. I mean, a quick thing I'll say is that my personal experiences with things like addiction and things that really stopped me from, or in the past had stopped me from living my best life, it was always that I needed those things because I didn't feel good. And I thought, once I feel better, I can let go of these things. But I was right about that. <laughs> but I was coming at it from the wrong angle. I needed to just address, I needed to express. It was all about expressing something unexpressed to the right person or the right situation. And then I would feel better and then I wouldn't need the, the crutch anymore. So really you don't need to battle your addictions. You need to express what is bottled up inside you and let that out. And then that's the restoration of flow. And once you're in flow, you're too busy in flow to give a crap about the stuff that is a distraction. So while we got a couple minutes left in our first hour, before we go to the Rockfin Patreon side of this conversation, I'd like to have you tell people about how to connect with you, if that's something you're open to, or how to help with the uh, book launch and where to look out for. I'll link everything that you describe in the show notes for sure, and you'll provide me with those links. But you know, how, how do you want to engage the audience if anyone's interested in going further with this idea and getting into your upcoming work? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'd, I'd love that. Um, you can find everything that I do at catroseastrology.com. That's cat with a C, Rose. Most people know how to spell that, astrology. And um, I've got a YouTube channel where I publish videos partly about astrology, but also about the daimon. Um, and yeah, I offer readings, astrology readings, as well as daimon readings. Uh, and the book, it's a long Kickstarter link, but it's running until October 31st. And you can get an early bird copy of the book, uh, signed editions and all of that good stuff. And I guess you'll have to link to that. Yeah. I'll put the Kickstarter link in the show notes for sure. Cheers. Thank you. Cool. So second hour, what we got on our plates besides anything that might just come in flow is the four faces of the diamond. This is something that's going to be a part of your book and then how some methods for connecting with the diamond. So we'll talk more about astrology, but other also creative ways to get communicative to restore that web of feedback loop circuitry within yourself and through spirit. So looking forward to going further with you, Kat. I appreciate that you reached out and shared with me the work that you're doing. And it actually is super well-timed that we're doing this today and fits in with other things that I'm very interested in right now. And I love how all that works out. Also love all the art you've got behind you in your studio there. <laughs> it's very li lively, lovely space. And it's been Super fun first hour. And thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. All right. We did it. Another episode down. Hope that one was a pleasant surprise for everyone. The topic kind of came to me out of the blue and I decided to run with it. It felt right. Intuition was like, yeah, do that combo. And I think that it paid off. Personally, it was fun to be inspired to share some of my deeper thoughts about creativity and the flow state, which, you know, I'm always talking about. And if you maybe took some clips and strung them together from this conversation, you could kind of get a full manifesto, as as Kat said, on my thoughts on the subject. So check out what she's up to if you like it and uh, continue tuning in here for more big stuff on the way. You know, I got to remind you how to get the second hour of this chat. Of course, that's through Rockfin or Patreon. Either one will work. There's links in the show notes and you can get the archive of all the extended shows and get busy catching up on the mountains of content <laughs> that I've been happily producing for a while now. It just keeps getting better, though. So, you know, there's never 
a time that's too late to jump in. I love it. Love what I'm doing. Yeah. So what else do I want to tell you about? Instead of really recapping things that we've discussed in this conversation, and I feel like we we nailed it. I want to talk about other ways that we can connect. So I've been reminding you that we've got a new show called Vibe Rant. And I'll just keep reminding you about that. It's only on the video platforms, YouTube and Rockfin right now. And last week on Wednesday, we talked to Mitch, the Oregon donor. He came back and we also had Carol join us for part of that. His, uh, I said his friend. She's our friend. She's part of our community on Telegram. And they told even more stories about the Wild West world of Oregon gifting and dealing with the geoengineering agenda through the vibrational way. <laughs> and it seems like definitely something's happening. Every day I just keep checking in with Mitch's updates on how, yep, still raining. Yep, the desert is still turning green. Reich would be very pleased with the results. Wilhelm Reich, the, uh, you call him the creator of Organite or the discoverer of Oregon Energy. You could call him those things, but really he was just describing a universal force that has always been there that many mystics and philosophers have talked about. And that life force energy, that vital life force energy is the same flow that nudges us along towards what it is that we're meant to be doing here and what fits best for our personal energy in the pattern of the larger reality fractal. So this cool conversation with Kat, I think is just one way of looking at a multifaceted phenomenon of finding and channeling your divinity into this consensus dream and making it the best one that you could be having. I think I'm doing it. <laughs> I've never been happier. Life is just better and better. I was getting ready to take this I'm really just doing what's fun and what feels good all the time. Like I was getting ready to take this outro on and I'd sat down to read a, a book for a little bit, see if maybe there are some things that are going to jump out at me and synchronistically connect to this topic. And instead what happened was the, a thunderstorm started outside my window and the overcast cloudy day broke and all the rain started falling. And I just felt this real, real call to take a nap and it felt awesome took a nap my cat and my dog were up there into it cuddling dog definitely needed it because he gets a little scared of the thunder and explosions <laughs> so anyway now here i am feeling good about doing this but just go with what feels right especially on the rest especially on the recharge just keep that life force energy in the state where it feels right Keep it right. Everything else is a reflection of that energy that you are the keeper for. And it's the only thing you got any say over is that is your charge. So there's that. I said that I say it a million times. I'll keep saying it. It's the secret secret sauce is your electricity. Uh, well, okay. So I told you about Vibrant this week. Those go down at Wednesday, 8 PM, uh, central time live. You can call in, hang out with us. Been doing other videos too on the daily Oracle card readings where I bust out my I Ching, my tarot and my animal deck. And we see what's in the ether to transmit that we can all resonate with in this amazing flow state gnosis that we are part of especially the telegram tribe. I can't tell you enough times to just like try out telegram. If you have even a slight shred of wanting to have some, some kind of like social media or internet connectivity to people, to human beings, telegrams where it's at, it's the future. It's where real conversations happen and not fake stuff, not advertisements, not profile picture posturing. None of that. It's just, you get into the conversation that the group's in and that's the direction things go. And we all sync up like that. You can have one-on-ones with people you meet there, of course, too. And there's so many groups besides the interverse group, but dang, the interverse group is good. Uh, links in the show notes for that too. Telegram. You can get it on your slave phone or your computer and let's do it. I want to see you there. So lesson here is if you're not 
following my YouTube or my Rockfin channels, go ahead and even try to get notified when there's new stuff or just check back regularly. Check back every day if you want the Oracle updates. Those are free. And I feel like really handy. <laughs> get some good feedback. I know what it's like for me to ponder the messages that come through throughout the day after I've put them up in the morning. If you want to see it live, there's kind of some cool juju with that. It usually happens, but around like 8.30 or 9 a.m. Can't promise because I'm doing my thing, but try to get them up as early in the day as possible. Uh, other stuff that we can do to connect with each other, me and you. I'm doing biofield tuning sessions, sound healing, or I call it biofield tuning. I hope that's okay because that's kind of Eileen McCusick's name for it. I don't know if it's like copyrighted, but... I didn't take her training directly, but I read her books very closely and refer to them and study her work. And I think that I figured out how to do that process by reading her describe about it and listening to her talk about it and connecting in my own experience with energy work and Reiki and Qigong and things like that. And it's awesome. I can do the, maybe I'll just call it like aura repair. <laughs> I can get in there and do this the thing where I help your body communicate with itself and heal the issues that have been stuck and not circulating. You heal yourself. I just get in there and like, I, I say, Hey, your body, look at this spot I'm pointing at this spot. I can tell there's a thing here and your body's like, Oh, okay. We got this. And it's sort of just like lifting us out of ignorance and letting us do what would naturally happen if our feedback loop circuitry was all connected. And you know what? I have a new word for that. I think feedback loop is just a cybernetic bunk term about circular logic and that kind of BS. And, you know, there can only be one Highlander bullshit. I'm calling it feedback web. When it's healthy, it's a feedback web because really it's not like there's a loop that starts here on your heart and goes in a line and, goes through every part of your body and then eventually comes back to the same spot. No, it's like your heart for, as an example, is connected to every other part of your body in a web and every other part of your body is connected to every other part of your body. So life is a feedback web, not a feedback loop. And that's my new trademark term based on the realization of how open communication is really supposed to work in our energy field and how much better it is when we get out of the binary, yes, no, circular logic, bogus thing and get everything talking to everything. That's where the magic happens. That's the sync generator. Other stuff we could do back to the Oracle cards deal. If you want to hit me up for that uh, or for a sound healing session, do it. And uh, Oracle cards are fun because... I can make you a video that answers your question by consulting the universal Oracle, if you will. And it'll be like the videos you see on my channel every morning, but personalized for you. And you're the only one that gets it kind of fun. You want one? I'm going to keep offering those until people want them right now. I'm just doing them for free. Maybe that's good enough. <laughs> Maybe I should back off doing them for free and ask for money, but you know what? You guys have done great job supporting me. I make some big life move changes and I'm going more deeply into the trust that this, what I'm doing here with you guys, what I'm doing here for myself, because it's the most fun option and most loving option that it will support me all those last two weeks in the, in the cards, if you will, just keep dealing these disc cards referring to shakeups and changeups and how we generate our livelihood. And I don't know if, any of you guys are there too, but I think it's time to trust that doing what is best for ourselves and what feels right, we can jump off of those cliffs and ledges and spread our wings and fly, but we're not going to get those updrafts and support from the universe and the thermal winds that carry our wings until we jump off the cliff. So don't be scared. Do your thing and see what happens. And it's also okay to transition gradually out of your sure thing safety net to your soaring high above the clouds. But at some point, the safety net goes away completely. No matter how slow and smooth and methodical the transition was, 
So that's where I'm at. Wish me luck. Send money. <laughs> and um, looking forward to how much more there for me I can be. And in the process, the, therefore, be there for you more, whoever it is out there that might want me there for them. I'm going to play us out with a track that has just been heavy rotation for me this week called Follow the Vibe by LS Dream. I'm not telling you to do LSD, but I am telling you to follow the vibe and you can trust it. And you might be like, well, where is the vibe? How do I find it? You will. And you'll know it when you do. And when you're in it, just remember that you can stay in the vibe and you've been there before and you fell off and forgot. And then you got there again and then you fell off and forgot again. But this time, if you're there now or you're about to be, let's do it full time. Let's stay in the vibe. Let's not fall off again. Let's not forget who we are. I think it's, I think it's time. I think it's time that we just stay full time magic. Okay. So enjoy this track. I really liked it. If you are watching the video version, I hope you are. So you can see the graphics I made with it. Cause I thought they were pretty spicy this time and watch out next week. We got some big things. Uh, our friend coach Sapano who was on Interverse earlier in the year, martial arts coach and spiritual teacher type dude. He's going to be on Vibrant on Wednesday and Friday of next week. Got a big surprise. Two guests are coming on together and uh, you know them <laughs> probably if you follow the things that I do quick, uh, closely or you're part of the Telegram circle. You know these two guys that are coming on. I'm not going to tell you who they are. I will tell you that we have a triplicity of fire in the works and that's going to be you got your Aries, this guy, me, and some powerful Leo Sagittarius combo. We're going to get fiery. <laughs> Spicy. All right. I love you all. Thanks for tuning in. Check out Cat's stuff. Uh, let her know you liked the episode and share what you do like about what I do and Support how you can and support yourself, most importantly. And I'll catch you guys later. Bye bye. What if there's this place only you can imagine? Somewhere lost in space, free to explore the park. I found a way into fantasy. Down a yellow bridge. Gypsy, and this is what she told me.